Jewish people and to tell Mordecai as well to fast for three days. Don't eat or drink nothing for three days and she's not going to eat or drink nothing for three days. And even her maidens are not going to eat or drink nothing for three days. And she also goes on to tell them and that I will go against the law, even though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. And in 16 verses, it says, and if I perish, I perish. Remember, these are perilous times. So Mordecai went away and did everything Esther had ordered him. So after these three days of mourning, Esther, probably scared, trembling, she appears before the king in the inner court. And as she goes there, guess what the king does? He lays his golden scepter out and basically welcomes her. So Esther, you know, she had a right to be scared, but she kind of was scared for no reason because the king he did that golden scepter so that she can speak before the king. And the king asked her, like, what do you, what do you want, you know, Queen Esther? Whatever you ask, you're up to half of my kingdom. You can have it. And so Queen Esther said, won't you and Haman come to a banquet at my estate or my house? And so, of course, after I guess they get through all their business, they go to the banquet, the king, King Xerxes, Haman, and Esther. And they have a banquet. Now, I know at this banquet, as the king is eating and drinking, he's wondering, like, what does Esther really, really want? So he asked Esther, like, Queen Esther, what do you really want? And Queen Esther was like, oh, you know what I want? I want you and Haman to come to a banquet on tomorrow night as well. So I know he's still kind of like pondering about what's going on, but he leaves it alone. They eat, drink, they be merry. And then King Xerxes and Haman, they both leave. Two men and they have two different reactions. And I'm going to tell you about the reaction that Haman had. Haman went to his wife and his household and he was like, I just had dinner with the king and queen. It was nobody but me, the king and queen. Uh, can you believe it? And I mean, he bragged. He was boastful, proudful, you know, not caring about anybody but himself, lover of himself. He was just beyond prideful, boast up, you know, he just was beyond himself. But even in him enjoying this dinner, as he was leaving, Mordecai was still at the gate, of course, in his morning of morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-G, morning apparel. And Haman passes by him. Now, Haman passes by Mordecai, and he thinks, oh, Mordecai needs to be trembling and shaking before me right now. And of course he should bow because you know that's what got them in trouble. The first thing that Mordecai wouldn't bow. Mordecai did none of that, none of those things. And so as he's telling his wife and his people about how the queen and king treated him, the last line he says, but this is all, and I'm in that fifth chapter around that 13th verse. It says, but this is all worth nothing. As long as I see Mordecai the Jew, sitting there at the palace gate. He just been there, and he is second in command. Just being with the king, the queen, and himself. And the only thing he could think of after boasting and bragging was about Mordecai not trembling or bowing down before him. So Haman's wife, Zeresh, devises a plan. She tells him, why don't you get a 75-foot pole or gallow, whichever it says, it's a pole or gallow, and won't you prepare that so that you may impale or hang Mordecai? This sounds good to Haman. So he has his attendants to go erect this thing that is set for, for Mordecai. You know, they're saying, be careful what you wish for. You know, if you dig one ditch, you might need to dig two. But we'll see what happens about Haman and his plot, his second plot against Mordecai. So as that is happening, you know, the next day, the people come, they get Haman, and it's, again, King Xerxes, Haman, and S, Queen Esther, they're all at another banquet or another dinner together. So they're eating, you know, I could just, they're probably having casual conversation. The king, again, oh, before we get to that, I told you it was two men, and they had two different reactions from the first banquet. 
Told you what King Haman did. Well, King Xerxes, when he went back, he couldn't sleep. He was just disturbed. And I imagine some of the things that was disturbing him was he really was kind of trying to see what King Queen Esther wanted. So because he couldn't sleep, he just called the scribes to just read some history to him. And as they're reading that history to him, guess what pops up? It pops up about what Mordecai had done for the king where he had saved his life some time back. And so the king asked the scribe, like, what did we do for him? And the scribe said, we didn't do anything. He was like, oh, okay, well, let me think. So I guess the next day or what have you, he got up and he asked the um, attendants, who's out there? And that's Haman out there. So the king asked Haman. He's like, Haman, what can I do for someone, you know, that I, I, I am happy for, someone that has done something for me. You know, Haman was already a lover of himself, boastful, prideful, covetous, you know, all those attributes. Guess who Haman thought he was talking about? Haman thought he was talking about him. So, you know, he gonna devise the best thing that the king should do. And this is what uh, King Haman says in that sixth chapter around the eighth verse. And that sixth verse, he said, Haman thought to himself, whom would the king wish to honor more than me? And that seventh verse, so he replied, if the king wishes to honor someone, he should bring out one of the king's own royal robes, as well as a horse that the king himself has ridden, one with the royal emblem on his head. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials and let him see that the man whom the king wishes to honor is dressed in the king's robe and led through the city square on the king's horse. Have the officials shout as they go. This is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. So he devised this grand old plan. As he finishes, the king said, that's excellent. And then he proceeds to say, go do that for Mordecai. I bet you Haman could have hung himself. Uh, he, he just was blown away because he couldn't, nobody could have told him that it was not for him. So guess what? Haman had to go get the royal robe. He had to go get the horse, the emblem, all that stuff. Had to go get Mordecai, set him upon the horse, and then old Haman, who, had, who thought it was for him, had to go throughout the city and, and, and say, this is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. And he had to do this throughout the whole promise. And I do believe if he was angry, he was burning hot red. You know how that cartoon where they got the, the, the steam coming up and the, the steam blows on the head? I can imagine Haman was that angry or even more angry than that. So after all that happens, Haman goes home feeling dejected and humiliated and he tells his wife about it. And his wife goes on to tell him, well, you know what? If this Mordecai is of Jewish birth, this is in that 13th chapter, 13th verse, is of Jewish birth, you will never succeed in your plans against him. It will be fatal to continue opposing him. So now, so he just left him alone for then. So the, the, the I'm sorry, Haman's wife even realized that maybe Haman should leave Mordecai alone. So now comes, I guess, the evening and the people go get Haman for the banquet that Queen Esther has prepared. And they also get the king for the banquet. And so they're casually talking. And I bet you the king is just still wondering what Queen Esther really wants. So he finally asks her, Queen Esther, you know, what, what do you want? Um, and so Queen Esther replied in that seventh chapter in the third verse, she said, if I have found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who will kill slaughter and annihilate us wow when the king hears this in the fifth verse he would say who would do such a thing king xerxes demanded who would be so presumptuous as to touch you esther replied 
this wicked one, Haman. The king, when he heard it was Haman, the king was so beyond himself, he jumped out and went outside. You know, within that, when that happened, Haman's face turned to fright. Haman grew pale with fright before the king and the queen. I mean, he was just scared. He was frightened. And he basically was pleading with the queen, please don't have the king kill me. Please don't have the king kill me. He even jumps onto the couch, I guess, that Queen Esther was on. It's like basically kind of pulling her, shaking her, like, please don't let them harm me. Please don't let them harm me. So the king walks back in. He's like, you're going to attack my queen even in my face? So the king's attendants came and they put a, a sack or bag over Haman's head. And in the ancient time, that presented your doom. They knew, he knew then that there was it. So one of the attendants, as they're putting the sack on him, they tell the king, oh yeah, by the way, Haman has a 75 foot pole of gallo prepared for Mordecai. Guess what? The king says, well, you put Haman on there. So Haman, that same ditch he does for Mordecai, he died in that same ditch because they impaled or hung Haman on what he had prepared for Mordecai. So the queen, the king asked him, what do you need me to do? So she was like, make a decree that all of my people, you know, are, are saved. So the people were saved. Not only were the people saved, they also gave Haman's estate to Queen Esther. So Queen Esther gave it to Mordecai to be over. They also killed Haman's sons, his wives, all the people. And then go further than that, you know, children of God, when we do what God says, further than that, they put a decree throughout all the land that anybody that was with Haman or that was plotting against the Jews had to be killed. And they killed a great number of people. And, um, if you go to that ninth chapter around that 14 verse, it says, So the king agreed and decree was announced in Susa, and they impaled the bodies of Haman's ten sons. Then the Jews at Susa gathered together on March 8 and killed 300 more men. Not only that, they killed like 75,000 men. This is what they get for plotting against God's people. Now just think if Queen Esther would not have done what she needed to do in these par those perilous times, such a time as this. So the Jewish, Jewish race was saved. And again, some of those trip, the uh, negative attributes that Haman had was, had was a love of him own self, covetous, boaster, proud, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 6, blasphemer, disobedient, he was unthankful, unholy, he was a truth breaker, a false accuser, he was incontinent, fierce despiser of those that do good. Remember, Mordecai was a good man. Oh yeah, didn't it forget to tell you in the story Guess who became second in command? So not only did Haman get Mordecai reward, Mordecai got Haman's reward. The king made him second in command. So it, it was King Xerxes and Haman. Now it is King Xerxes and Mordecai. Ain't God good? Look what God will do for you if you keep him first. Also, some other negative attributes for negative attributes for Haman when he was a traitor. Had he high-minded, he was, of course, a lover of himself. So those are some of those negative attributes that he had. But us as Christians, that's not how we should act in perilous times or even in times of trials or in times of tribulation. We have to act like Christians and we must have Christian attributes. And, of course, in the Bible, a good way to go about Christian attributes is, of course, the fruit of the Spirit. And we're going to go to Galatians 5, 22 through 25. And we're going to talk about some of those fruits of the Spirit. It says, in it, again, Galatians, the fifth chapter, in the beginning at that 22nd verse, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. You know, Esther had a love for God. We got to have a love for God, for Christ, and also our fellow man. You know, that's our great commandment. You know, you know, love thy neighbor as thy love thyself. Also, love our God as thyself. So those are 
some attributes that we must have even in perilous times. Not only love, but joy. You know, we got a joy. Uh, Esther had a joy in, in God. We have a joy in God and also a joy in Christ. You know, even when we're going through those trials and tribulations, even when things ain't working right in our lives, we know that we have an inner joy that no man can take because we are the children of God. Also, peace, having a coolness. A blessed assurance knowing that God is in control. Long suffering, patience, being patient that God will either deliver you or he will give you strength to see you through. Gentleness, kindness to others, goodness, do good to others, faith, having faith in God or having faith in Jesus Christ that he is the son of God and having faith. You know, I talked about that in my last message about having faith. You know, the first question I, I asked you is what is faith? You know, we went over that faith in Jesus Christ. Then I went over what is faithlessness, not having any faith in God and Jesus Christ. And then I asked, where is your faith? Well, right here is telling you, you got to have faith. You got to have faith to know that God is going to protect you. He's going to lead you and he's going to guide you even in perilous times. Also, meekness, meekness, again, which is gentleness and humbleness, temperance, which is self-control. You know, we can't be incontinent. We can't be impulsive and do everything that our mind thinks. We have to have temperance, self-control, you know, allow God and Jesus Christ to control us and to use us as he sees fit. Uh, against us, there is no law. And then down that 25th verse, it says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit you know when our enemies attack us when we feel like we can't take anymore when we feel we are weak we we feel we may not have no hope we gotta remember as christians even in perilous times just like mordecai and esther we gotta have faith that Jesus Christ will see us through. Even when our enemies are attacking us, and sometimes they will prevail, we still got to remember they will prevail for a time, but God will always have our back. You know, the Lord led me to tweak our theme just a little bit. You know, our theme was women of God standing strong in perilous times. Well, let me tweak it a little bit for you. I'm going to add to it. We got to have faith. We got to have faith to be women or men of God standing. You know what it says? Standing. We ain't talking about that. We're going to get to that. Standing strong, knowing God is in control in perilous times. Again, we got to have faith to be, be women or men of God Standing strong, knowing God is in control in these perilous times. We got to have faith that God will lead us. We got to have faith that God will protect us. We got to have faith that God will never give us more than we can bear. And I'm going to read that. You know, that's actually not a verse in the Bible. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, and, uh, and towards the middle of that, it says, But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So he won't give us more than we can bear. You got to have faith that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. You can get that from 2 Timothy 1 and 7. You gotta have faith 
saying? When we are weak, guess what? God is strong. And another thing we got to do, we got to put on the whole armor of God. And he led me to give you Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of not your might, but in the power of his might. Hallelujah. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, that Haman was a wicked man. You know, we have wicked, that, that, that person you work with may be a wicked person. That, that person in your family may act in a wicked way. But we got to pray for them and we got to do what God tells us to do. Wherefore, take unto you again at 13th verse, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having to done all, women of God, men of God, Having done all to stand, stand in these evil days, in these perilous times. 14 verse, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, your loins, and having on a black breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that is God's words. Also above all, taking the shield of faith, Wherewith ye should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying. That's what we got to do when we're facing perilous, tribulous times. We got to pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication of all saints. Again, saints, I got to say, we got to put God first. We got to, even when it's good times, when it's trials and tribulations, when it's perilous times, we got to have faith and we got to be women and men of God standing strong, knowing God is in control in these perilous times. We even got to know when we are weak, God is strong. I'm here to tell you, don't give up. <laughs> don't give in because we got a Savior that sits on the right hand of God. He will be there and he will always see you through. Whatever you may be going through, you got that wife that ain't acting right. You got that husband that ain't acting right. You got those children that ain't acting right. You got family that's bothering you and bugging you and begging you. When all things, when all hell and turmoil seems to be on every hand, we got to know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is in control. And he needs us to preach to a dying world. Because it may not be now. Because no man knows the day or the hour. But we got to be ready. We got to be ready to help to usher in other people because if we don't, they are doomed to hell. They are doomed to perilous times for the rest of their lives. We are not children of God. Even when we go through trials and tribulations and perilous times right now, we know that we got God that is in control. We know that we got a savior who came here on earth through a virgin birth. Glory be to God. Walked on this earth, performed miracles. He healed the sick, raised the dead, gave sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, took away demons. Our savior. But guess what else he did for us? He went to that old rugged cross. And he was on that cross for three days. My Savior did that for us so that we could have a hope in perilous times. We could have joy when we're going through tribulations. He did it for me. And guess what? He did it for you. 
But I have to tell you, he endured that cross. He endured before the cross. He endured the beatings and being spat upon and being whipped. But after that third day, on that Sunday morning, my Jesus rose again so that we, you and I, may have a right to the tree of life. So regardless of what we're going through down here on earth, we got to know that we got a Savior that knows all. We got a God that sees all and who knows what we're going through. But we have a hope and a joy and a peace of mind that this is only for a little bit of time. And we will be able to spend eternity with our Jesus, with our Father. So yes, we're saints gonna have perilous times down here on earth, but we gotta know that our Jesus is in control. We gotta know that he is there for us. We gotta know that even when we're going through things, he is there for us. Amen. Turn it off and we'll do it.